Hi, Bob Nagy here, AB5N, with another equipment review. I hope this one is going to be shorter and right to the point, give you what you need to know. Today we're going to talk about the Ameritron ALS 600 Solid State PowerFET HF Amplifier. Delivers a nominal 600 watts. There's a lot of interest in these type of amplifiers and a lot of new contenders in this field. The ALS 600 is domestically made in one of the lowest price units you can get in this power solid state amplifier arena. A lot of the amps out there are using Motorola MRF 150s. Now Motorola originally made this device, Macom makes them now, and this is a track proven solid state power fet, uh, great for HF, and they can deliver 150 watts easily if they're on a good heat sink. So there you got four of them in this amplifier and gives you the 600 watts nominal output. You can order the ALS 600 in two versions, and the RF deck is the same, but the power supply, which is separate, is a switching power supply if you prefer, which is half the weight, or the old traditional linear power supply, transformer, filter caps, all that stuff. They are 50 volt DC power supplies capable of delivering enough power to run the amplifier. Both can run on 110 or 220 and you can internally solder switch those. The default setup is 115 volts. Uh, if you need the lighter weight because you're going to go out in the field or something like that, well, Maybe the switcher is good for you. They've done a lot of extensive filtering and engineering to make sure the switching power supply is noiseless on HF and linear is tried and true. It's the one I got. You can go out and read all the reviews on this amp. You probably already have or you may do yet. And realize that a lot of these comments are referring to earlier revisions of this amplifier and power supply. The thing has been out over 10 years and it's just now getting really, really popular. They're hard to keep in stock. So um, just re realize that it may be referring to an older version. And of course, Ameritron listens to these ideas and complaints and, and, and revises stuff. A lot of simple little things. So um, the newer one can be, uh, the newer RF deck can be identified by two RJ45 uh, Ethernet type connections on the front of the RF deck. So you'll know that's the newer unit if you see it. Also, when you, if you do buy this, when you open the box and you move out the, uh, the RF deck itself, you can hear a little rattling. There are ferrite beads on some of the wires in there and they can move around. It's not a problem actually, but you know, it can, it can be a little disconcerting to hear something moving around in there. So just remember, unless you're hearing actual screws and washers moving around in there, if you're just hearing a little clink, that's probably the ferrite bead in there. So let's talk about what you need to know about this amplifier. It comes in two pieces, like I said, the RF deck and the power supply. They're roughly the same size. They're not that big, a little bit taller than your average HF rig, but a little bit narrower, the power supply being a little bit bigger than the RF deck. Now, when I examine these, these look to be among the best quality that Ameritron has put out as far as the engineering fit and finish, the feel of the product. Now, it still doesn't look like a modern Japanese HF rig. It still looks like a piece of, you know, ham gear. <laughs> These two are connected by a multi-conductor cable with a multi-conductor uh, pin connector on the other end that goes into the RF deck that I've never seen before and maybe, you know, proprietary or whatever. doesn't much matter. It's a fairly thick cable and it is six feet long. Uh, now, 60 watts of drive is going to drive this amplifier to full power output, which is over 600 watts. Uh, it varies on each band just a little bit, but it's pretty darn close. So the amplifier really does deliver as spec'd. Any five, anytime you have over 75 watts of reflected power coming back, say your SWR is 2 to 1 or greater, it's going to trip out and go into a default shutdown mode, which you have to reset the power and it resets the amp. So it is protected, and that's if you select the wrong band. Uh, on the band switch on the front as well, it'll kick out, and that seems to really work well. The front panel meter is the uh, cross style uh, meter, and it seems to be very accurate. You'll see a lot of guys uh, checking against you know NIST calibrated meters, and the thing is darn accurate, I must say. And it's also uh, upgraded to LED backlighting, so those things are not going to burn out for you. It's got the nice white LEDs in the background. Um, it uses a front panel ALC control, and this reduces the drive from your rig. So you initially set it up by adjusting a rear rotary ALC control on the back of the RF deck one time when you set the radio up, and then as you turn that front panel ALC knob, it'll just reduce the drive from your from your radio in case you want to reduce for, you know, RTTY, FM, AM. But they do suggest that on AM you do not use that ALC to reduce the drive. You want those peaks to be available in AM. But for FM and RIDI, you want to bring that back. 
uh, AAM, you're going to be running about 150 watts continuously by reducing your input, and that's going to be something in the you know 10 to 15 watt output range uh, from your radio, and then le leave that open for your peaks and AM peaks. But uh, as we well know with solid state amplifiers, you have to reduce your um, power output when you're in those continuous carrier modes. Of course, for digital and stuff, you're not going to need that really, that kind of power. Day two. The keying setup on the amplifier is pretty much a standard deal. You've probably seen it before. Two RCA connectors on the back of the RF deck, and these are the ALC and PTT lines. Uh, I didn't have any problem interfacing these with a IC7600. Uh, on the 7600, you do have a choice of two different keying lines, the relay or a solid state keyer. I put it on solid state and it keys up, but we're looking at 12 volts at less than 100 MA on the RF deck. That's pretty much standard across the industry and most radios are going to handle that just fine. There's also the ARB704 from Ameritron, which is an interface box which handles all of the signals. Now for the 10 and 12 meter option, uh, you've got to buy a $29 board. And of course this radio, you know, this, this RF deck can be used on uh, chicken band and they want you to pr provide a license and uh, then they'll put the board in the uh, box with the amp for you and when you get it, you install it and it is very easy. It is a four minute operation, three minutes of which are taking the case screws out. <laughs> and then once you get inside, it does come with an instruction sheet. You'll see exactly where that board has to go with the four little screws there. That takes about one minute or less. But uh, on mine, I did have a little bit of a snug fit. The two little caps there, they're not so little, um, we're sort of pushing against the board a little bit, and I just gave them a little nudge over. I actually did take a blade and take a slap it off the circuit board on the edge there to just make it fit a little bit nicer. So you probably won't have that problem, but if you do, well, that's, that's how I addressed it. Um, the actual gain of this amplifier is at 17 dB. Now, the devices are natively that much gain. So the truth is, the way this is configured with four MRF 450s in the final there, you could drive this thing to full output with, you know, 10, 15 watts or so, or, or a healthy output, let's say. But what Ameritron does is put a 35 ohm resistor on the input to cut down the 100 watt from your radio into the amplifier. So I'm sure if you wanted to match this up to a KX3 or other, you know, 10, 15 watt radio, even a 5 watt radio, drive it somewhat, um, there's probably instructions out on the interweb. Void your warranty. <laughs> but uh, take a look around if you want to take that option. I know people have done that. This amplifier uses an open frame relay for TR switching. And let's, let's take a look at it. Um, there have been reports that there is oxidation of the uh, contacts after a good period. And of course, you're you have the blower in there, it's pulling humidity, dust particles, pollen in the spring all the way through that amp and through those contacts. And uh, you know, you can clean it off with some uh, contact cleaner or a little bit of uh, emery cloth or whatever once in a while. People say about six months or so of continuous operation, they have to clean them off. Or uh, I made a little cover for mine uh, reading that. Now I just cut out the bottom of a uh, plastic spinach container and use a little tape and put a little cover on it. Now that'll probably keep the dust and stuff out, might extend its life a little bit, but the truth is this amplifier also, because of this big relay, is not a QSK amplifier. It's not going to key super fast and allow you to get that you know fast break-in stuff that a lot of you high-speed CW ops like. Luckily, there is an option board on the market out there. Now, I'm seeing uh, 85X, 85K, those calls attached to this board. Take a look around, Google that, and see what you can come up with. Uh, this fellow sells the board alone. You order the parts separately. It's a couple of very small sealed relays, fairly small, and some other little parts that mount on the board. Um, it looks like installation is not trivial, but not difficult. And if you're a you know diehard CW op, high speed op, and I'm talking you know 30 to 80, you, you might want to do this mod. Um, I'm going to see how my relay operates over a good amount of time, and if I want to put that in, I'll put it in. I might even order the board and just stick it in the drawer for a while. But uh, you do have that option to make this a real super quiet, fast keyer. Nice to have that option. Um, one of the other issues that you hear out there is blower noise, and predominantly on the uh, power supply. Now, I'm addressing the linear power supply, not the um, switcher here. I'm not sure what the switcher's doing. but Taking a look at the linear power supply, there's a 80 millimeter standard case fan in there. And it does make 
quite a bit of noise. Now you do have six foot cable, you can put the power supply under the table, and really, you know, when you're running an amp, you do expect to have a little bit of blower noise. But uh, also to consider is that the RF Tech has a 120 millimeter fan in it. And that, uh, on inspection, I don't know what they were using a couple of years back, but there is a nice looking Pabst fan in there, 120 millimeter. That thing moves air pretty much silently, or I can't hear it above the 80 millimeter fan in the power supply, I'll tell you that, uh, even with the power supply on the floor and six feet away. So what folks are doing is ordering low noise and ultra low noise fans to insert in there. And uh, these are ubiquitously available out there for seven to nine dollars uh, in both sizes. So take a look around. Um, you see a picture of one there. Uh, the 120 millimeter, if this is a retrofit, if they've upgraded the fan, I'm not hearing any noise on the RF tech, but if you if you you know gets to you on that power supply, uh, Go ahead and pop a, a low noise fan in there, and it should be a four screw install, no big whoop. <laughs> Probably take most of the time taking the case screws out. Um, also, the retrofit fan, uh, they tend to come in 12 volt. And be sure you get ones that just have two leads. They have ones now that have a third or fourth lead for remote uh, adjustment of pulse width, modulation, all kind of stuff from your computer. You don't want those, you want the straight, straight one. But um, you can bolt one of these in there, just be sure you get one that's a 80 millimeter and looks like the same form factor. They have low noise and they have ultra low noise. So pop that in there if you if that does uh, bug you. Uh, but as I said, they do come in 12 volt. And what you want to do is there is a 12 volt uh, output in that power supply for stuff in the RF deck. And you can tap off of that to run the fan. So no big whoop, seems like a lot of people have done that. Uh, let's take a nice little tour of the RF deck and the uh, power supply inside. So in conclusion, the ALS 600 does what it says it will do, and in a very nicely behaved manner. Um, you know, for myself, I've had a lot of amps through 44 years of hamming, and I land up selling them. Uh, I have trouble with them, uh, you know, changing band, retuning, using, uh, you know, it, you have to baby the tubes a little bit, the high voltage supply, it's generating a lot of heat, you know, you live in a warm area, you don't, don't really want to blow that heat in the room. so. Um, I'm really happy to get a fairly lower cost amplifier that'll take me within one S unit of a full legal limit amplifier and it's click, turn it on, no tuning, bam, you can get the little uh, interface box that will make the uh, radio change the bands automatically and that's the remote position on your front uh, panel switch there. I'm gonna get one of those, that's gonna be really nice and then it's just like you got a 600 watt radio. Bam! Especially once you got the fans going nice and quietly. It's not a trivial amount of money. I mean, you know, you can get cheaper amplifiers, but the nearest competition on this is about twice the price, and it's not domestically made. And so you got to consider your serviceability and everything else. Uh, uh, they have good reputations, but then again, you know, having a nice linear supply on this thing, and a, the guys down in Mississippi to back you up. Uh, you know, I'm expecting to run this thing for a long time without any problems. I got to change that filter cap out in the linear supply 10 years from now. I'm, I'm happy with that. It'll probably outlast me. Um, I give it two thumbs up on the AB5N uh, reviews. And I did want to mention two things that are going to happen to you. If you're a guy that's running, you know, typically running your 100 watt radio and a dipole or wire antennas, 
and you uh, get this amplifier, two things are going to happen. One of them is you're going to get that DX on the first or second call. Bam! Like shooting fish in a barrel, it is almost too easy. Great reports. The second thing is sort of an unintended consequence, and this is that you're going to get called back at when you're signing off from QSOs by stations which are running 100 watts or less, or QRP, and they're thinking, man, the band's in great condition. This guy's coming in fantastic. You're, you know, you got a great signal. And they're thinking that you hear them the same way, and many times you do not. So you get a lot of, get a lot of guys calling you that have uh, poor signals uh, hearing you like gangbusters. So <laughs> that's one of your, you know, unintended consequences on getting an amp and, and uh, playing with the big boys. So, there you go. I expect to own this amp for a long time, and, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy with it. So, until next time, take it easy. AB5N.